All right, this is lecture number 10 on DES, okay? Two-part lecture. We're going to do part one first. All right, we all know what a secret or a public key algorithm is. We've talked about this. This is all review. We've talked about it many times already. Symmetric key. Is it the same key or different key? Same key. Same key, exactly. One key for both encryption and decryption. The encrypt key is the same as the decrypt key, so it's basically the key. We have issues with that. If the key gets compromised, obviously, if either key gets compromised, since it's the same key, we have an issue with that. Okay. So I can encrypt with one key, decrypt with a different key, or, or even the same. It really, it's the same key, so it doesn't matter. Okay. All right. One key per channel. There's the math on calculating how many keys we need. You've already done this, so that's not a problem there. Uh, public key, on the other hand, separate keys for both. Again, all this is repeat so far. We encrypt with one, decrypt with a different one, but they're in pairs, so they work together. Okay. Or now, does it now? If you notice those two lines right there, they're basically the same except I swap the keys. Does it matter which key I use? Because the first line says I encrypt, so I took my plain text, encrypted with the encryption key, and decrypted with the decryption key. But what if I take my plain text and encrypt it with the decryption key? Can I? Decrypt with the encryption key? Actually, you can. They're a pair. As long as you don't mix them up, you don't have a problem. As long as you encrypt with one key, decrypt with the other key, and don't mix them up, you're fine. Because you, when you generate the keys, they're identical. You just label them. You label, okay, this is the private, this is the public. As long as you don't mix them up, you're good to go. Okay? And two keys per user. Again, nothing new here. This is all new, all old stuff. Okay. Secret key, obviously symmetric algorithm, same key. They're actually faster. DES is the one we're going to be focusing on now. It stands for Data Encryption Standard. Okay. There's also Skipjack using EES, which we won't be covering. AES, which we will be covering a little bit later in this course. Uh, we have the single key for both. Encryption, decryption, same. Okay. So the secret key is only known to A and B. And obviously the decryption key is posted out there somewhere. So and nothing really new here at all. Okay? Nothing new. Okay. So there's some problems with them revealed keys. If we're using the same key to encrypt and decrypt, if one of the keys gets out, that's an issue. So key management's a problem. Distribution. So I'm going to encrypt something with Josh over here. Josh lives in Russia. i got to get him the key somehow. So we're actually learn about Diffie-Hellman later in the course. We actually learn how we could do that over the internet. So um, could be a large number of keys. So if I want to talk to Josh or Ann Brett, Ann Chris, and so on and so forth, we need multiple keys now. Okay. So we get quite a few. Okay. So it says the decree went throughout the land to find a good secure algorithm. We need a good cipher. IBM answered that call with the Lucifer cipher. Made by IBM. True stuff here. Okay. It's a cipher. It's, well, the cipher, it's a cipher based on the Feistel structure. It's a symmetric algorithm where encryption decryption operating is nearly identical. We just manipulate the key schedule. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It's just a way of doing this stuff. Okay. Horst Feistel is the one who really came up with this way of doing it. Okay. It's based on the Lucifer cipher, okay? So why do you think DES was based on the Lucifer cipher? Anybody know? Well, the Lucifer algorithm was based on the demon algorithm. Demon, devil, Lucifer. Make sense? Well, actually, it was based on the demonstration algorithm. When IBM, IBM presented it, they presented the demonstration algorithm. Nothing to do with the devil whatsoever, but it was written in APL. APL couldn't handle the length of the name of demonstration, so they shorted it, shortened it to D-E-M-O-N, which then became the devil, hence Lucifer. So it's really not based on the devil at all. It's really just short for demonstration. So it's, yeah, kind of funny. Okay. 1977 is when NIST adopted this. Adopted this. 
developed for use by the general public, so anybody could use this. It was it's actually still used to this day, still being used. Okay. It's accepted as a worldwide standard. Both hardware and software implementations. Which one do you think is faster, hardware or software? Hardware is always faster, always faster. So if you see a question on a test that says which one's faster, the answer is hardware. hardware. Good. It does not Central Intelligence Agency for CIA, by the way. I'm just, just saying. How Somebody many missed, that. missed that. What? How many people missed that? I think one. I'm not positive. I think I don't even remember what they selected. It was. It wasn't CIA. I don't know, at this point, though, I've been in at least three different courses where that's been a recurring theme. So. Yeah. Sen uh, Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Yeah. Kind of important. You need to know those. Yeah, well, they go really through all the courses. Everyone up as if you'd had availability and then the next one had accessibility. That you could kind of. No, it's availability. Okay. So let's talk about the algorithm for DES. It's a complex, complex combination of substitution and transposition ciphers, which we'll look at. 64 bit blocks with a 56 bit key. We go through 16 rounds, and we can use the same algorithm for encryption and decryption. Has anyone ever shuffled cards before? Not good, I think we Okay, I used to work with a guy who used to be a professional blackjack dealer in Vegas. He was in the military with me. The guy was amazing. He could sit there with a deck of cards, shuffle them up. And he could say, okay, he takes a card out. One card. Ace of whatever it was. We'll say it's an ace of spades. He go, here you go, hold this card. What do you think you got it? Hell no, you never get it. The guy was good. I don't know how he ever did it. He literally would take that one single card out, show it to you, hand it to you, look at it, you end up with a two of clubs or something. You're like, the guy was amazing. But the point is, we're going to learn more about that, but 16 rounds, why? Do you ever, when you shuffle cards, you really shuffle them 16 times? We're going to read a little bit more about that here in a little bit. Okay, here's a crappy picture of it. But basically, we, have, so we do something at the beginning, we break it apart, we do a bunch of other stuff 16 times, and then we end up with our output. Okay? Found that picture on the internet. Kind of sucks, doesn't it? But I got a little bit better one. But that's really the way the algorithm works. So let's talk about how it actually works. We have the initial permutation, so we do something. Then we go through 16 cycles of something else. With the key transfer, in other words, we're using a key that's being manipulated. Then we undo what we did at the beginning to get a result. That's all there is. Really, these top three lines is all you need to know right there. So how does that actual cycle work? Well, we take the 64 bits, we break it in half. We break it into two halves of 32 each. Okay. The left side, we don't do nothing with. Well, so we're only working with the right side. So what we do is we take that 32 bits for the right side and expand it to 48 bits. Then we XOR it with a key, which we're going to see what XOR I think we already talked about XOR. We're going to talk about more in a minute. But we XOR it with our key. Then we run it through a substitution box, which then takes it back from 48 down to 32 again. Then we run it through a permutation box. Again, all this is on the right side only. Then we export with the original left-hand side, and then we put them all back together again. Okay, let's see how this works. Okay, let's follow along with this picture. So we got our input here at the top. Okay, where's my pen? We want a black mark or black pen. So we, we get our input. How big is our input? What size? Sixty-four bit exactly. We take that and we go through what's called an initial permutation. We'll see a picture of that in a minute. We take the 64 bits, we run all of it through this initial permutation. And if you notice down here at the very end, we undo what we did. Okay? But in the meantime, we split it out. So we took the 64 bits, we break it in. So we got 32 here. We have 32 here as well. You notice the left side, we don't do nothing to it. It's literally just hanging out. So the right side, we take a copy of the right side, right here, this is a copy of it. We take a copy and bring it down, it becomes the next left. But in the meantime, we run it through a substitution box with our key, a permutation box. Then we take the original left, XOR it with the right, 
and so on and so forth. So the right becomes the next left. So this, you know, we, we bring this down to XOR, it becomes the next right. A copy of that becomes the next left, so on and so forth, 16 times. It sounds confusing, but it's not so bad. Okay. Here's the initial permutation. We base it, It's hard-coded. A certain bit goes to a certain place. So bit 1 up here goes to bit whatever this number is down here. Bit 2 goes, some, you know, base. Anyone ever play Spirograph when they were a kid? Is anyone old enough to know what Spirograph is? When I was a kid, that was cool. That was the Minecraft of the day. But you could draw stuff. You took this little pencil and you went through it and made, you know, really cool stuff. So that's the initial permutation. Took all 64 bits, basically mixed them all up. And then we do the opposite of it with the final permutation. Here's where everything went. So with the initial permutation, bit 1 went to bit 40, bit 2 went to bit 8, bit 3 went to bit 48, and so on and so forth. If you note them, there's actually a pattern there. Okay. The final permutation, now look at this picture right here. Final permutation is pretty much upside down. We're undoing it. Okay. So that's the initial and the final. Now, the homework assignment, you actually have to do the initial permutation, but it's actually using the finals numbers. Go by the ones I give you on the assignment. Okay, you only have to do it once anyway. So, all right, now let's talk about the cycle. So we took our left side, which is 32 bits, and our right side, which is 32 bits. Everybody with me so far? What happens to the left side? Nothing. We do nothing to it right then. But that left side gets XOR way down at the bottom. Okay. So have we talked about XOR yet in here at all? XORing is one or the other, but not both. I'm going to bring up a little notepad here. Okay. Let me get it so it fits on the screen. So, if I have a 1, oh. Okay, then I'm going to give, let's see. Okay, with XOR, it's one or the other, but not both. So, 1 and a 1 becomes a 1 or the other, but not both. So 1 and 1 becomes okay. 0. It's both. So, one. so 0 and 0, 0. 1 or the other. So we have a 0 and a 1, so that becomes a 1. 1 and 0 becomes a 1. 1 and a 1 becomes a 0. 0 and 0 becomes a 0. So 1 or the other, but not both. Wouldn't the second one be a 1 for those two zeros? No, 1 or the other, but not both. 0 and 0 is 0. 1 and 1 is 0. The, the only one that's a 1 is the 0 and a 1. Okay. 0 and a 1 or 1 and 0. That's one or the other, but not both. Yeah. So that's what's called XOR. I can't spell it. Anding would have been a 1. But okay. So what we did was the left side get brought down. The right side, we expanded that 32 bits to 48 bits. So we made it larger. Then we XORed that, because this is another XOR, we XORed that result with our key. This is our key over here. We'll write key. Sideways. Yeah, look at that skill. You like that? Yeah. It's a lot of skill to do that. Basically, our key is 56 bits. It's actually split in half, and it's actually rotated, which we'll see here in a minute. That's run through the permuter choice, so the 56 bits comes down to 48. So we have 48 bits coming in from here. We have 48 bits coming in from here. We XOR them together. That result is then passed to our substitution choice box, which then takes 48 back down to 32, is run through the permutation choice box. Again, thir 32 going in, 32 coming out. So that resulting 32 is XORed with this left 32 and that result becomes the next right side okay the right side we started with becomes the next left side everybody see that a little confusing isn't it initially this was based on a secret algorithm that no one knew why and 
it's kind of like, and if you think about it, is uh, Windows an open source software? No. Which means Microsoft wrote it. Microsoft does not tell us what they did. They just write it. But what if there's a massive flaw in it or something? Who knows? Microsoft's the only one who knows. Linux, on the other hand, is open source. We all can look at it. We all can find vulnerabilities in it. But we all can find vulnerabilities in it. So I'm mean, thinking of both ways. It's good because we can find the vulnerabilities, but it's bad also because we can find the vulnerabilities. Okay? So it's good and bad on both ends. All right. The expansion permutation, that's, whoops, go back. So right up here at the top, where we're taking the 32-bit and, and expanding it to 48-bit, you need to do this part for your assignment. Expansion permutation takes the 32-bits, duplicates some of them, and they become 48-bits. And that's what happened. So bit one, if you notice on this picture right here, bit one goes to bit two and 40. Actually, they don't show both of them on here, do they? Yeah, they do. Okay, yeah. Remember, this is bit one right here. See this first guy? You'll see he gets copied down to bit two, and he also gets copied all the way over to bit 48. See that? And then it's just two of each method. So one goes to two and 48. So if bit one holds the value of zero, I mean that zero gets copied to bit two, and that zero gets copied to 248. So bit two goes to bit three. Bit three goes to bit four. Bit four goes to bit five and bit seven, and so on and so forth. Everybody see how to do this? See how that works? You have to do this as well. Okay. I wrote a quick little Java program to do it for me. It's pretty simple. You can do it exactly. Do that way. There's lots of different ways to do it. You don't even need a macro for it. Actually, you can just take a you know this cell equals this cell and this cell. I mean, it's not the big deal. So, all right. Now let's talk about the S box, the substitution boxes. Remember, the S box brought it back down to 32 again. So we came in with 48 bits. See this up here? We got 48. You'll notice between bits one through six, only four of them get used. Bits 7 through 12, only 5 through 8 gets used. So basically, this 48 bits becomes 32 bits. Okay. So far, so good? You do not have to do this on your assignment. Here's what happens to the S boxes. Okay, and You don't have to do this, but they are hard-coded as well. This is the math where everything goes. Okay. P box, the permutation choice box. Those are hard-coded as well, and there's where they all go. So bit 1 goes to bit 9, bit 2 goes to bit 17, so on and so forth. Okay. I haven't made the homework assignment long enough to include all this yet. Aren't you excited for that? Someday. Someday. So there was our cycle. Everybody understand all those parts? It's pretty simple. The shift. Now we're talking about this part up here now, this whole key shift up here on the top left. Okay. Key shift. On cycle number one, we shift by one. Cycle number two, we shift by one. Cycle number three, we shift by two. All the way through cycle 15. Then on cycle 16, we shift by one. So the key is actually shifting as it goes through. Why did they do that? I don't know. I, we don't know why they did it. It, it was secret for years. You know, probably true. We don't know. I mean, there's a movie out there um, called The Beautiful Mind. Ever, ever seen that? Excellent movie where this guy just knows statistics. In there. And he actually proved that all the statistical research that had been done for years was based on bogus data. Everybody took it as reality. And he proved it was all wrong. So all this research for many, many, many years was based on, hmm, let's start with five. That could be why they did that. I don't know why. I don't think we'll ever know why. Why did they, I mean, you think about it. You know, there's no such thing as a random number. You all realize that. It's always based on a seed of some sort. Even if I asked you in the room now to pick a number between 1 and 20, whatever number you give me would be based upon something. Maybe number 7 is your favorite number, but you think... That's everybody else's number, so then you're going to add one to it, so now it's eight. But still, it's based on something. 
So there's a reason they did it. I don't know why they did it. I never read it in a book why they did it. Now, if you read the crypto book, which at least one person read in here, who developed, um, was it I say? What was the last bonus question? Someone got it right. Um, James Ellis. Was it I say? Who answered that one correctly? One of you did. I answered that one as Claude. So. Um, okay, uh, was it RSA? No, it wasn't. Yeah, it was RSA, the public key encryption. Um, basically, it's RSA, Ravesh Shamir and Alderman, but James Ellis had actually developed it years before for the NSA, but he wasn't able to tell the world about it because he worked for the NSA. And people even asked him, that, like, don't you, doesn't that suck? You actually developed something years earlier. He said, but that's part of my job. I couldn't tell anybody about it. So, yeah, you had to read the book to get that bonus question right. So maybe it was whoever's not here today. I don't know. But uh, um, I know, I don't remember his name right now, but whoever it is that sits there, he had the book. Okay, he might have. He might have been the one to get it right. Answer. Yeah, James Ellis was a uh, Claude Shannon was one of the answers. Um, Di uh, Whitfield Diffie was the answer of another one. The 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 bonus, by the way, were shifted by the question number, or the question number minus one, because I think I did add one question in the middle. But instead of all being shifted by three, if you shifted by the question number, you would have gotten The first Caesar cipher solver on Google will guess it for you. Yeah, they, they do pretty darn good. Yeah, I, I did that to verify they all worked. But, and then on the arbitrary, oh, let's just shift it by a couple. Yeah. The more steps, the more yeah. secure, right? right? So find a couple of places where you can add in an arbitrary shift and should help it, right? Right. Yeah, and it, it actually works very well. Okay, there's the permutation choice box again. You don't need to do this for assignment, but I'm assuming there was a reason they did this. Okay, so we know our cycles there. Are we okay with this? How many cycles is it? How many bit key is it? 56. How big is our block? 64. How big is the left side? What do we do with the left side? Nothing. Nothing. That becomes the next right side. Well, kind of. Kind of does. Okay. All right. So here's pretty much the math for it. So the left side becomes the next right side. And the right becomes the left XORed with the function of the prior right in the key. Again, you're not, you don't need to know this. But this is the math behind it. Okay. And it's the same hardware can be used for both encryption and decryption, which makes it nice. Okay. Keys are submitted in reverse order, so backwards. Okay. Some security issues. You have to know the design, not the, uh, you have to know the weaknesses of this. Okay. First of all, secrecy. The rationale behind the S boxes, the P boxes, and so on and so forth was not released. Why did they come up with those? We don't know. It says, Congress inquiry exonerated the NSA, but we still don't know why they did it. We assume there was a reason for that. Okay? It says, possible design flaws, the NSA released information about the S-boxes. No S-box is a linear function of their input. In other words, based on what it receives, it doesn't manipulate it based on input. It says, changing one S-box changes at least two outputs. But there's also a problem with that. If you make it so that one input changes at least two outputs, there's a re I mean, that's not a good thing either. And we'll see once we get into AS why that's not a good thing. S boxes were chosen to minimize differences between the numbers of ones and zeros when a single input is used. Okay? Number of iterations. Are 16 enough? Or is 8 not enough? 8's probably plenty. But we were hard coded at 16. AES is not hard coded. You can tell it do as many times as you want. It's kind of like, you know, I use a program called S Delete. I use it in forensics to wipe my drives. I can tell it to write once, up to seven times. How many times is good? What do you think? Um, I do believe guidelines say seven. Seven is supposedly for, but still, isn't one enough? If I literally go through and overwrite every single bit, there's no more, the old bits are gone. So is one enough? To be safe, let's do it twice. So why do we do it seven times? I do believe with that S delete in forensics, you still end up with the temp folder. 
Yeah, which yeah sucks. But um, so the point is, why 16? Wouldn't eight have been enough? And if we're talking speed, obviously 16 is going to be twice as slow as eight. So were they doing this to slow the algorithm down? I don't know. We don't know the answer behind that. Okay. Eight was sufficient for then. Yeah. So what about now? If it's supposed right. to double every two years, yeah. well, your 16 just got you four more years. Right. That's true. How about the key length? Originally, they had a 128-bit key. Then they lowered it to 56. If you're reading that book, there's a big old section about this where they're talking about that the NSA made them lower it to make it so they could break it. I don't know. Okay, Diffie Hellman, with 106 chips, each testing one key per millisecond, would require 20 hours to brute force attack. So a $50 million machine would cost $20,000 per solution. So if I really needed the answer, is 20000 a lot of money? Not if I'm the government or some foreign government that I need the answer. Okay, 1998, a $130,000 machine could crack in 112 hours. January 99, they broke it in 22 hours, oh, in 15 minutes. So how long does it take now? So, basically, we're at the point now, DES will no longer certify it. I'm not DES. The government will no longer certify it. But it is still being used today. Okay. So, weaknesses. I can see why it would be used still, because that was 22 hours, but 100,000 PCs at like 256 million right. a second. Right. So, we're going to talk tomorrow, not tomorrow, next week about other ways of doing it. But some design weaknesses, key complements. In other words, the opposite of the ciphertext was made by the opposite of the plain text and the opposite of the key. It's not a big problem, but it is a problem. Okay? Weak keys. If you come up with a specific key, it actually generates a, it's not as good pretty much. So if your key is all zeros or ones, well, you think, why would we ever choose a key that's all zero or ones? Well, why would the president of Syria choose a password of one, two, three, four, five? People do that stuff all the time. Okay, semi-weak keys. It says, what if you know specific keys are made that multiple keys are decrypted? That's a bad thing. We don't want more than one key to work for this. Okay, so here's some weak keys. All zeros are all ones or one half of the other. So that's a bad thing. Okay, here's some semi-weak keys. You need to know these weaknesses. Okay. Design weaknesses, expansion permutation, repeats first and fourth. Again, you don't need to know the, the particulars, but you need to know design weaknesses. You need to know weak keys, semi-weak keys, stuff like that, okay? So it says expansion permutation repeats first and fourth bit of every fourth bit. Crossing, we showed that already. We saw what was kind of like a pattern in there. S-boxes drive last three output bits in the same way as the first, okay? Two different but very perfectly chosen S boxes will produce the same output. Again, that's a collision. We don't want that. Okay. Key clustering. Two more keys produce the same encryption. Again, we don't want that either. Okay. We want one key produces one encryption. We don't want that to happen. Okay. Differential equipment analysis is a powerful crow breaking routine. It says using careful selected pairs. So if I sat there and crafted my input and my key, and if I can come up with certain output, that's a problem. Basically, they're not going to recertify it. Okay, so let's talk about double encryption. So if Des is weak, what if we use two keys back to back? Is that twice as good? So if we encrypt our message with key one, then our encrypted message with key two, is it twice as good? So instead of 22 hours, it's not going to take 44 hours. Is that correct? It's not. So. 56-bit key is 2 to the 56th. So is two 56-bit keys 2 to the 112? No. It's not. It's 2 to the 57th. Because remember, when you go from 2 to the 56th to 2 to the 57th, we're really only doubling the value. So that's the same. So, okay. Mark will prove that. So, all right, that's the end of the first part. Stop this.